So thank you, those 30 people who already responded to that survey. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it on Wednesday, uh, but I could already see the 30 responses. And so one of the issues that people are having trouble with is not having a textbook. But we did that to save everybody about 100 bucks, right? Uh, but what I'm doing is there's this chem wiki from UC Davis, which is sort of laid out like a textbook. And I put up a link to Lewis Structures, which is what we're going to be doing for this week. So, and if you go through, if you scroll through this thing, it's just got all the stuff I'm going to cover, a very simple stuff, and it includes things like little uh, videos and everything uh, about how to make Lewis Structures. So, uh, I'm going to put up links on the Chem Wiki to all the stuff that we've covered so far, and you can just print it out or whatever way you like to interact with it, but it gives you a place where you have textbook style material based on what we're doing. But I'll choose the things to be precisely the concepts we've been covering. Uh, okay, just to let you know that that's available, we will be going over all the stuff for the midterm uh, when the time comes the following week. Okay, and now back to uh, this stuff. So, so this week is all about bonding, and we're going to learn how to go from knowing about the number of valence electrons for an atom to how that determines these things called Lewis. Oh, that, that was when I was, uh, that's what would be covalent bonds, Lewis structures, which tell you which bonds form. And then by the end of the week, we'll go from knowing that to what the shape of the molecules are. And we're also going to have a little demo today, if we can get it set up. Uh, the demos are popular. Uh, I got that. Uh, okay, so, so these Lewis dots of atoms, I'll show you how they work and what the rules are. Uh, and this is what we're supposed to cover today, but it'll run into uh, Wednesday. And notice now our periodic table is magically staying up. Uh, the, these, these are magnets here. Uh, it's the strongest uh, magnetic material in the world, these lanthanides, and these are the materials that Megan works with in her lab, uh, which is how come she has those magnets, and see just half a dozen of them hold up that weight. Okay, so we've already, so this is about covalent bonds, uh, and we've already seen it's where you share electrons. Uh, this is an energy diagram of two, this is two hydrogen atoms when they're far apart. And this is just like Jake's skateboard uh, thing. This is the energy as a function of their separation. So when you bring the two hydrogen atoms together, they, uh, they gain potential energy. They go down in potential energy. And the lowest point of this energy curve is what we call the equilibrium uh, point where the two hydrogens are stuck together with their chemical bond distance. So what happens is as two hydrogens come together, they, uh, potential, they gain potential energy uh, and form this hydrogen bond. We'll get back to that. So at first, if you take them in free space, they attract each other. They can uh, gain energy by getting closer. And then if you push them too hard together, they repel. And this happens for most pairs of atoms. But especially in this case where the at two atoms are the same, then we'll get to what this delta is, but it means the electrons are shared equally by the atoms. Okay. Uh, so for each element, like we, the ones we have here, you give it a bunch of dots. So the dots are going to represent valence electrons. And the number of dots you get is equal to the number of valence electrons. So that's going to be equal to the group number, right, along the periodic table. Uh, so, so you've got lots of dots here for the fluorines and the chlorines. You've got seven. 
And over here, say you've got two for the beryllium because they're in the uh, second column. So they're going to tell us which covalent bonds form because each dot is an electron and you add them together and you put the two dots in the middle and that means they're sharing the electrons. So then each hydrogen has a share uh, of two electrons. Another way to write it is with a straight line. Uh, so you can either write the pairs of dots or the straight lines. Here's chlorine and it has seven electrons, so two, four, six, seven, seven valence electrons and another one with seven. And what are they going to do? They're going to share uh, just one each. So once they share those two electrons, uh, or we could write it this way, this means just two, the, this is the same as having uh, two dots. Uh, so the ones that are not involved in bonding, pairs of electrons are called lone pairs. Uh, and the octet rule is that everybody wants to form eight valent, uh, uh, have it, shares in electrons, so they have eight valence electrons, or hydrogen is two, like, like here. So these two, the two electrons in the middle are considered shared by both atoms. And these are just simple rules that tell us which, which bond, bonds prefer to form. Uh, okay, so how to draw Lewis structures, the quick way, so, so you add up the valence electrons of all the atoms, so you're given three or four atoms, uh, as you will be given uh, during the simulations this week. You use a pair of electrons to form a bond uh, between each pair of bound atoms, so every se uh, sort of sets of atoms must form bonds. Uh, uh, and you fill in the, the to, until you satisfy the octet rule or the duet rule for hydrogen, but for the bigger ones, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and, and other ones in the main group, and subtract to get delta n, the number of leftover electrons. So, so, so you try to satisfy the rule, and if, if delta n is zero, if there are no dots left over, you're done. If it's less than zero, uh, so if you've used too many dots, uh, you need to move some of them uh, to make some extra bonds, or if it's greater than zero, uh, and you've satisfied, uh, you've made all the bonds you need, then you may have to violate the octet rule. And you only do that with third or higher row elements. So the, the bigger atoms, you may have to violate the octet rule. And we'll see one or two examples of that. Uh, so a simple example is water. Our water molecule is H2O. Uh, so let's add up the valence electrons of all the atoms. So hydrogen, how many valence electrons has a hydrogen? How many for the oxygen? Six, right? Uh, oxygen is here, so it's six. Uh, so one each for the hydrogen and the six, so we have eight all together. And then you're going to use pairs of electrons to form bonds. Well, the hydrogens can only make one bond, because then they satisfy their duet rule. So that's two electrons there, two electrons there, that's four. So we still have four left over. Uh, so we have to put them in uh, to try to satisfy everybody's octet rule. So at the moment, oxygen has only got four electrons. It needs eight. Uh, so we put two lone pairs uh, on the oxygen, and now it has eight uh, because it's sharing those two, and the hydrogens have two, and everybody's happy. Now notice, remember, I didn't bring it today, when we had the little molecule representing water, it was not in a straight line like this. Uh, the two hydrogens are actually off at an angle. We're going to see on Friday how you figure out those angles. At the moment, what we're trying to learn is what bonds to what, right? The dots are going to tell us that there's a single bond between this oxygen and hydrogen and another one here. And once we know how to do the dots, then we can, it's simple to figure out what the, the, the angles are, what the shape of the molecule is. So here's two electrons, two electrons, eight electrons, and everybody's happy. So that's how you, so chemists all the time count electrons. Uh, if you really want to uh, diss 
somebody's explanation of what's going on, you ask them, have you, well, have you counted the electrons, right? That happens all the time in inorganic chemistry. The worst thing you can do is make a mistake in counting the electrons. Okay, another simple example, CO2. CO2 is going to figure very prominently in our last two weeks together. Uh, so what, uh, how does that bond? So we go through the procedure. First we figure out how many electrons we have to play with. How many valence electrons is carbon? Good. And how many for the oxygen? Six. So you end up with quite a lot, right? Sixteen. Two sixes for the two oxygens and the carbon. So then you want to form all the bonds that you're going to need. So here's a couple of bonds uh, that only uses up four of our electrons. We've still got 12. Uh, so that's still quite a lot. And then we want to satisfy octet rules for these three guys. So let's see, here, here is our skeleton that we're filling in. So, uh, so, so since we've used four, we've got 12 left. Uh, and to satisfy the octet rule, right, we would need six more on each of the oxygens and four more on the hydrogen. So that's 12 plus 4 is 16. 12 minus 16 is minus 4. So that's telling us we need two more bonds. Uh, because you divide that number by 2 and it's negative, so you need to make some more bonds. So to make two more bonds, it's pretty straightforward. We can put them there and there, and now it should all work out. So now we've used up eight electrons. We have eight left. I think uh, so. We put on four lone pairs, and let's see. Does it show us? Oh, sorry. So uh, so this guy here now has eight electrons. This guy here has eight electrons, and this guy here has eight, because each of these is two electrons being shared with the carbon. Okay. So these are simple examples. Here, here's some more C2H4, right? So that's more complicated. You've got to figure out how things are bonded together in C2H4. Uh, so again, we count how many electrons we have to play with. After a while, we get good at it. So two fours is eight, plus four more is 12. Uh, and if you go through the procedure, uh, you would find first you know, you put one bond between the carbons, put on the bonds to the hydrogens, you find delta N is minus two, and so then you say, okay, I need another uh, bond there. And now everybody is happy. There are no lone pairs here. Uh, we didn't have to add any more electrons once we put that bond in. CN minus, uh, small and compact. Now there's 10 electrons, so carbon has four, nitrogen has five, it's next to it. But we, this is CN minus, so because it's an ion, right, that's telling us there's either one more or less electron. Because it's a minus, it means there's one more. So there's 10 electrons total. And when we go through the procedure, we find there's a triple bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. Uh, so, uh, and then we find lone pairs on each of the carbon and the nitrogen. So each one of these has eight. Uh, and overall, it has a negative charge. And that's how you indicate that, by putting square brackets and a minus on top. And this guy has eight electrons, this guy has eight electrons. So you go through the procedure and you figure out where to put the bonds and where the lone pairs are until the octet rule is, is satisfied. And here are different bond types. And these are the bond lengths. And it would, it's also true for the bond energies that so, so uh, single bonds tend to be uh, longer and then double bonds are shorter. So if you take a CO single bond, this is in picometers, uh, and it's 143, and then it gets shorter when you form the double bond. Again, carbon-carbon single bond, double bond, triple bond. It gets shorter each time. So in space, these things shrink. And also, the energy of the triple bond is greater than the energy of the double or the energy of the single. OK. So before we do more, are, you, are we ready? Uh, Thank you.
Okay, so uh, now we've got to do the lights. So remember we were talking about the elements and their properties. Uh, so this is magnesium. We're going to do a little experiment with magnesium metal. Now, those people at the, in the front rows may want to back up against the wall. I'm just kidding. Uh, I got my goggles. Uh, so we need the lights. Oh, here's your gloves. Here's your gloves. Uh, so you would know. Uh, do metals usually burn at regular temperatures, right? They do when you uh, heat them up very high, right? But remember, we said that the alkali metals were very reactive. These guys are so reactive. We're not going to play with them here. But here are the alkali earths. They're a little less reactive. They don't have one outside electron. They have two. Uh, and magnesium can be made to react uh, when you heat it up uh, with the oxygen in the air. Now, we got, uh, wait, 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 right? Uh, Put this over to the side. Is that all the lights? And maybe I should close this down. Uh, we can't cover that thing, I guess. Turn off, oh, the, yep. Uh, oh, there we go, right. Uh, well, are, are you ready? Yep. So we're gonna burn some magnesium here. And see how bright it burns. Uh, so it's much more reactive uh, than regular metals once you get it to react. We're going to do another one, in case you didn't see that. Uh, do you need some light? I can give you light. There we go. Uh, are, you re are you ready? Okay, here we go. So burning magnesium. So it's the magnesium that's reacting woo, with the air. Now you don't want to put that in your hand while it's burning. It burns pretty hot, right? Do you know what temperature it's at? Uh, Hot. <laughs> so if you think about your fireworks, you know, when, you, when they shoot up, they shoot up metals into the air, and then they create an explosion, and it's hot enough to make the metals burn, and different metals burn different colors. And so you can make, so if you guys remember those fireworks that do the really bright bam, like really bright light, those are magnesium. And so a lot of people who make fireworks are chemists because they understand the properties of different metals. There are chemists who sort of failed in academia, and so uh, they went into this sort of twilight uh, industry. And now it's not a metal anymore. It's hard to see. You can come up after class, but they're white because they created... Wait, oxygen. wait, wait. What, are, what have they created? Magnesium oxide, the formula for which is... Well done. Yeah, okay. Uh, Okay, so yeah, so you can take a look at that uh, after. Any questions about the magnesium? So that was just a little entertainment uh, break, right? Uh, uh, now, and, and the, yeah, the Lewis structure for that wouldn't be hard. Uh, but that's got a metal with a, with a non-metal, whereas here we're talking about Non-metals and non-metals. Okay, so here is NH3. Let's do that one. Uh, so one of the things about this stuff is you just do it by practice, 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 and you'll see in your homework you get a bunch of practice uh, this week. So count the number of electrons, five for nitrogen, one for the hydrogens, that's eight. Uh, and so when you fill in your diagram, you need the three bonds to bond the, the nitrogens. That would be six. Uh, you would have used up six. Uh, and then to satisfy your octet rule, uh, you find you put the two last electrons on the nitrogen. And remember, we had that, pic that, that molecule with the silvery thing on top that was a lone pair for the nitrogen uh, in our plastic kit. CH4 is very simple because eight electrons, you just share them, carbon with the four hydrogens. And we'll see a lot of uh, 
uh, of hydrocarbons that are certainly part of organic chemistry but are used in all the oil industry and stuff. Uh, you can either have single or double bonds between, uh, between carbons and single bonds to all the hydrogens. Uh, but that's how you end up making long chain carbo uh, hydrocarbons. CF4 is easy once you've done CH4 because fluorine uh, is short one electron just like hydrogen is. So therefore you know it's going to come out the same way. Uh, but if you do the electron counting, there's an awful lot of electrons because there's seven for each of the fluorines. Uh, but you do that and it's going to look exactly the same except you've got to put dots around all those, those fluorines, six of them, and they share one with the carbon. And that's the Lewis structure for CF4. And again, if you were asked for uh, 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 CCL4, uh, it would be exactly the same except with chlorines there. And that's the, so that's the use of this, the, these columns in the periodic table. Remember, as you go down a column, you always have exactly the same number of valence electrons, right, uh, in the main group. So, uh, okay, so that's, so that's how you put the dots in. The next, so there's a few different principles, right? The next one is electronegativity. And it's a sort of measure of the atom's desire to gain electrons. And they were first, first written down by Pauling, uh, who was the person who really figured out uh, how chemistry works, uh, using the rules of quantum mechanics, in fact. Uh, and he's one of about four people to ever get uh, two Nobel Prizes. He got one in chemistry for this kind of stuff and one, he got the Peace Prize uh, for his sort of fight against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, so in electronegativity, he wrote down a scale uh, saying uh, how, how much each of the atoms wanted to gain electrons. And this scale is, in, is all over the place. You can look it up. Uh, and I think this is his scale. There are slightly different versions, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so he, these numbers here are electronegativities. And fluorine is the most electronegative uh, element. And it has electronegativity of 4. And then the least electronegative are uh, the metals and especially the alkali metals, and they have electronegativities less than one. Uh, and what you do is you look at the, el the elements in a molecule and you ask who has the most electronegativity. Uh, because uh, we'll see that the, the, the central atom is often the least electronegative. There are two questions. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why they have them in here. So for our purposes, they don't have any electronegativity because they don't bond, right? So they've put them in here somehow to make some rules, but they only bond under very special conditions, and we won't be doing that. So they really shouldn't be there at all as they don't have them. Because you can only tell what, somebody's elect what an, an atom's electronegativity is by comparing its bonding patterns with other elements. Yeah, so they, uh, they were probably put in when they first started making those uh, few compounds uh, to make them fit with all the others. Uh, but they really shouldn't because they're not really forming regular covalent bonds. So the main effect here is that these guys are much more electronegative. The nonmetals are, are quite electronegative and the metals are less electronegative. And as you go so as you go across, electronegativity tends to increase, or as you go up, it increases. But you don't actually have to really know much of that. So you can think of it this way, or you can remember a very simple word, which is Fonkel Brischk. Uh, uh, but but Fonkel Brischk, if you just practice. Uh, you know, whenever you brush your teeth, you say Fonkel Brisch. Uh, then you, this gives you everything you need to know about electronegativity. So what it is, is the most electronegative elements 
in, in, in decreasing order of electronegativity. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine, sulfur, carbon, hydrogen, phosphorus. Uh, so so th once you know that, then you can figure out uh, who, who, all you really want to know is the first thing you want to know is which is the least electronegative element in your compound. Uh, and this is just plotting electronegativity uh, as a function of atomic number. And these, you see these variations are just the ones I just told you, uh, where it uh, increases along, uh, along a row, and then it decreases as you go down a column, right? Uh, oxygen so oxygen is... Uh, so oxygen is here, right? It's just before next to carbon, uh, next to fluorine, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it, so, so the chemical bond, the atom with the highest electronegativity gets the most sort of share of the electrons. Uh, and you can count sort of how covalent a bond is by the electronegativity difference. If the electronegativity difference is zero, then you're perfectly sharing the electrons. Uh, and if, uh, if it's greater than two, then we sort of consider it an ionic bond. Uh, so between a non-metal and a metal, because the metals have low electronegativities, the non-metals have high, usually this will be greater than two. And remember I said this distinction between covalent and ionic is a little artificial. There isn't a... a hard line between them, so this is how you quantify it. So in the covalent, they're mostly shared. In the ionic, there's more of a transfer of an electron. But really, it's a continuous thing. Uh, so big electronegativity difference is ionic, small is covalent. Uh, so now, so, so I showed you little examples first that are simple. And there really is no way to think about how the atoms might bond together. But as you take more atoms and put them together, uh, you will get uh, more choices. So, uh, so you use the Lewis structure to figure out which is the right choice. Uh, so only often only one of them will, will make a sensible Lewis structure. So here we have this formic acid. And you see, we could bond the carbon and the oxygen. There's five atoms, and you could bond them different ways. But only one will have a sensible uh, Lewis structure. So we add up the number of electrons, which in this case turns out to be 18. Uh, and here's a, a new rule. So take the least electronegative atom as the center of the central uh, structure. So if we use our, we could either use funkel brisk or we could just guess where, uh, which one it's going to be. Uh, so hydrogen is not going to be in the middle, so it's between carbon and oxygen. So if we look at carbon and oxygen, uh, uh, carbon is not as much to the right as oxygen is, so carbon will be less electronegative. Uh, or if we do funkel brisk we see that uh, oxygen F-O-N-C-L, so oxygen is second and carbon is further down, so therefore oxygen is more electronegative and carbon is less. Either way, uh, we come to the same conclusion, so carbon is in the middle. We want to take care of those oxygens, there's two of them, and now we have two hydrogens to attach somewhere, right? So we might try attaching them here and here, and then we see what happens. So we've used up four, we've made four bonds, uh, so that's eight electrons, leaving us ten more to deal with. Uh, but here's another possible arrangement. They could be attached to the carbon, or here they could all, they could be, this hydrogen could be attached to that oxygen. So these are three different possible structures, uh, and we have to fill in ten more electrons. Each one has four bonds, and we need to fill in ten more electrons. So then we go through our procedure, and we find out... Uh, uh, which uh, we, f we fill those in, so we have 10 more electrons, so here we put lone pairs on this oxygen, that's pretty obvious, and since he's only got one bond, we put the uh, lone, three lone pairs on him, and so that's 10 more electrons, so that's done. Uh, or uh, 
when we do that, we can see that uh, in order to fulfill the octet rule, it's better to move one of those lone pairs to the carbon. Uh, and that looks good. If we check each atom, we find it satisfies the octet rule. This one here, we try to fill in the electrons. And then uh, we can't move a lone pair to the carbon because it's already got four bonds, so it has eight electrons. So that doesn't work. And we put them in here. And no matter which way we try to put them in here, it still won't work out. Uh, now this oxygen has too many, right? It has. Uh, 10 electrons. So what you find is you can think of different possible structures and only one of them will have, will satisfy your rules and, and therefore this is the correct structure. And then if you actually make this molecule in the lab you discover this is the bonding arrangement. So Lewis structures tell you which, which exact uh, bonds are formed between the atoms. Uh, Here's a harder one. Uh, well, it, looked, uh, it looks simpler, but there's a complication. So carbonate is an ion, one of those standard ions. It has two minuses, two extra electrons. And it's a CO3, so it has a lot of electrons. If we count them all up, it's 24. Uh, so four for the carbon, three times six for each of the oxygens, and two extra electrons because it's a two minus. Uh, so who should be in the middle here of the carbon and the oxygens? Which one will be the central atom? Carbon, least electronegative. Uh, so here's carbon in, in our mnemonic and here's the oxygen. So remember this is, fluorine is the most electronegative and it's going down. So this is the skeletal, this is when we start, we make those, those bonds. And then uh, we have to fill in the rest of the electrons. So we had 24 to begin with, uh, so we've used 6 in the three bonds, leaving 18, which is 9 pairs of electrons, so here putting 3 on each oxygen, but that doesn't look right for the carbon, right? The carbon is still short a couple of electrons. Uh, oh, and we have, we, uh, it's also got to be, it'll be 2 minus overall. Uh, so here we switch one of the lone pairs on the oxygen to make a bond with the carbon and this is now looking pretty good. Uh, so this is our, our Lewis structure. Now we're going to see shortly that there are in fact a couple of uh, other options because there's no reason why the double bond should be on this oxygen as opposed to that one or that one. So they'll be called resonance structures because you have identical structures which will have the same exact energy, but they'll be permutations of each other. We'll get to that in a minute. But this is a correct structure for uh, the carbonate. Hydrogen peroxide is a tricky one. Uh, so the question is, we've got four atoms. Are they all in a line or are they branched? Uh, so how, how many electrons are, are, how many valence electrons are here? 14, right? S uh, six each for the oxygens and two for the hydrogens. Uh, well here, I mean the hydrogen is never in the middle, right? Because uh, it's only got one bond, so it's got to be oxygen in the middle. Uh, so we can put the two oxygens together, and then where do we put the hydrogens? We can put them there, or we can put them so here we have them either one on each oxygen or uh, uh, both on the same oxygen. And we have to decide which one of these is correct. Uh, so uh, we fill in the rest of the electrons. So we had eight left over. And uh, so we could try them on the oxygens. And they look pretty good. And then on this one we try them. Uh, on the oxygens as well, but we put three on this one and only one here. And then lo and behold, this thing satisfies the octet rule, and so does this thing. So this is a more tricky example because it has two uh, valid Lewis structures, and we're going to need another rule in order to figure out the difference between them. Are, you, are, are we with me still? Uh, 
Okay, so how do we tell which of these is the correct structure? Uh, so there's one more rule, it's called a formal charge. So it's a way of telling when it turns out two different arrangements seem okay, uh, what, how do you tell the difference between them? So the formal charge is the difference between the valence electrons of an isolated atom and the number of electrons actually assigned to that atom. So, so for each of the atoms, we know how many valence electrons it has by itself. And the question is, uh, how many does it have in the molecule? So any non-bonding electrons, all those lone pairs, those belong to the atom in the, mo in the molecule. And then you give it half of each bonding electron to count how many electrons it has in the molecule. And then you compare it to its, uh, what it has in isolation. So if we take our hydrogen peroxide, uh, we can count the formal charges on these oxygens and see uh, does it add up to their to six, right? It, it's supposed to be six. So if we look at a, one of these oxygens in the molecule, uh, the number of valence electrons is we've got two, four, and then it gets half of each of them, right? Uh, one for the hydrogen because it's got one pair six for the oxygen, six for that oxygen, and one for that hydrogen. Uh, because these count just for the oxygen plus a half for each of the bonding ones. But these are the numbers for the isolated atoms. So you can think of it as making a cut along the bonds and then asking how many electrons belong to, to one atom. Uh, and the uh, number, yeah, this is the number of assigned electrons in the molecule is exactly the same. So there are no formal charges. So formal charge is sort of, uh, will, will this atom be a, lit, a little negative or a little positive inside the molecule? As in, has it lost a bit of an electron or gained a bit of an electron? Uh, it doesn't mean that it's very positively charged or very negatively charged, but uh, formally uh, it isn't quite balanced. So here it's, it's perfectly balanced, that's okay. Uh, so the sum of the formal charges is zero. Uh, now let's look at the other case that we had for the hydrogen peroxide. So here the atoms are labeled one, two, three, and four. And we see, uh, uh, we, we count up the, so the valence electrons of the isolated atoms are six, six, one, and one. Those are the two hydrogens, those are the two oxygens. But now we do this cutting business to see uh, what the uh, electrons are in the molecule. So if we, if we look at this one, it has two, four, six of its own electrons and a half share in that one. So one has seven electrons uh, in the molecule. And if we, count, if we look at this guy, there are three shared electrons and two of its own, so it has five. So here, the formal charges, uh, this oxygen has a minus one, it has an extra electron, and this one is short an electron. So even though the octet rule is satisfied, uh, these are slightly unhappy atoms because they have these charges. Uh, the sum is always going to be zero because uh, the number of electrons is always the same in the molecule as the sum of the atoms. So we draw this as having a minus here in this region and a plus here because this guy has a, effectively an extra electron inside the molecule and this is short one inside the molecule. Uh, so the sum of the formal charges is always equal to the total charge of the molecule. So now we've assigned these formal charges and then what is the rule that tells us which of these is the right Lewis structure? Uh, so the, you want to avoid formal charges. So the, the, if you have no formal charges, that's a preferred structure. Uh, so this is all different ways of saying the same thing. And then if formal charges are present, they're more likely to occur on the more electronegative atom. So you want to, if you have to have formal charges uh, in different structures, there are no structures without formal charges, then you should put them on the mo most electronegative atom. So given these rules, is that the left guy or the right guy is the right Lewis structure? The left. 
because he has no formal charges. Uh, okay. So that's how formal charges work. So all this stuff you just do and you practice and then you get the hang of it and then it's okay. So, so yeah, uh, the, the valence was just meaning the valence electrons of the isolated atoms. So that's, you know, this is, it doesn't matter what it's doing, this is an oxygen, so that's six. And then the assigned is how many electrons you've given it inside the molecule. That's what those two labels were. And it's the difference between those two. So, 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 so the, I'm not, yeah, the, I'm not sure how great the drawing is. Though that pair, this, this lone pair is with the oxygen, right? Then these are bonds. So when we cut out this oxygen, the lone pair stays with the oxygen. Uh, each one counts one. And then you get one electron for each bond that the oxygen is connected to. That one, yeah. Sure. Many people, by the way, in the survey complained that the lecture is far too slow and they were asking for m more content to be delivered faster. Uh, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll discuss that on Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so now let's go back to our carbonate ion. Uh, remember, we had this, 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 this this example here and we said this is a perfectly good Lewis structure but let's see about its formal charges right uh, so so we do the cutting and we see that here we're going to see that there's uh, things are not going to balance uh, so so for so this is just labeling the, the these one two threes these are the different atoms but we label these two the same because by symmetry they're going to come out exactly the same as each other uh, and then we do the cutting, and we see here this oxygen has seven electrons, right? The six from the lone pairs plus one bonding. So that's not right, and this guy has seven as well. The carbon is fine because it's got the four bonds, and this is a regular oxygen with a double bond and two uh, lone pairs. So this guy is fine too, but these two have the formal charges. So one has a... Uh, has a formal charge of minus one because it's got seven electrons in the molecule, but it's supposed to have six. Uh, so this means these two minuses here, where they're going, uh, are... So this, this is correct because if we add these all up, there's two of these, so you get minus two, which is the correct number, and we draw this by putting a minus on each of those atoms. So that's how, you, once you know about formal charges, how you assign them within the molecule. So remember, since the formal charge equals to the actual charge, uh, when, when, whenever you have an ion, then the, there must be formal charges. Uh, and again, he, the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5 and, and oxygen is 3.5, so this is good. The formal charges have gone on the oxygens. Uh, is that the right way around? Uh, Okay, so now HCN, uh, this is reasonably straightforward, I think. Uh, so we go through our procedure, uh, figure out how many electrons. Uh, we got five for the nitrogen, so that gives us 10 in total. Uh, put the least electronegative atom as the center, so which one is the least electronegative? carbon. Uh, so we put it in the middle, the nitrogen and the hydrogen, then we got a few more electrons to play with. Uh, we try to fill them in. So we put in a triple bond here and a lone pair. This looks pretty good. Uh, this carbon uh, satisfies the octet rule. This nitrogen satisfies the octet rule. And if we want to see does it have formal charges, uh, so, so nitrogen should be, uh, should have five uh, yeah, uh, carbon should have four, 
car this carbon does have four, but this uh, and this nitrogen has five, so we're fine. Uh, last example, CHO2 minus. Uh, so 18 electrons. We try this structure here. Uh, fill in the rest of the electrons. The, this this is looking problematic. Any oxygen you ever see with those the seven, uh, you know, with six electrons in lone pairs and one bond will have a formal charge. Uh, the oxygen is minus one. This oxygen has zero. Carbon is fine. Uh, so the sum is minus one, and that's good because it's CHO2 minus, right? So we put the minus next to one of the oxygens. Okay. And, uh, and so is the charge always residing on this oxygen as opposed to that one? Well, sort of for symmetry reasons, there's really no way to tell between one oxygen and the other. We can only see the difference because we drew the structure. So in fact, both occur. Uh, okay. So that was very fast, I know. Uh, we'll go over it again slower on Wednesday. Uh, you can keep your, keep your notes uh, if you want to, uh, because that was very fast. Is that the... Hmm? Oh, yes. Is that the right structure for... This is the wrong structure for... For the H, right, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, yeah. So, he, uh, so in this, this one here, this is not the Reich Lewis structure for the hydrogen peroxide, as we saw, but the question is simply to assign formal charges. But I, I often draw my electron pairs as just a bar next to the atom. So each one of these here it should really have two dots. Uh, for those bars. Ah, now there's a periodic table in the way. Uh, ah, yeah. Here. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm doing it. There we go. So the question is, what is the formal charge on this one? Okay. Uh, see you Wednesday. Thank you, Megan.